receives in one night eight visions, one right after the other. This is a wondrous thing to contemplate that God would speak to his people in their situation. And of course, anytime we have the Bi- a passage in the Bible that we examine, we understand <clears throat> that God is speaking in time to the original recipients. And that doesn't mean that the message is not for us as well, for indeed it is. But the Lord speaks to a beleaguered group of people, the returnees, those who have been part of the exile of 70 years, being punished by God for their sins over 490 years, and that the time was fulfilled and they returned to Judea, Samaria, and to Jerusalem. They were tasked with rebuilding the temple, they faced opposition, they flagged, they were distracted, and God calls them in the beginning of Zechariah to repent. And so the visions come to a people who have been called to repent. Uh, The visions come to give them encouragement and to give them perspective, to give them comfort and to give them direction. And as we come to the second vision, which comes hot on the heels of the first one, We find that Zechariah is still in thought about what he has just heard in the first vision, which is telling the people of Israel that God has a passionate love for them and that he's going to care for them and complete his purposes. But there's one part of the previous vision that needs to be addressed further, and so a second vision arrives. We come, therefore, if you're not already there, to Zechariah chapter 1, you want to Plant your ribbon there further going forward firmly. And uh, it's in a part of the Bible people are not as familiar with. It's among the 12. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 18. I'll read verses 18 through 21 and then expound upon them for you. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me for craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. So when we come to verse 18, Zechariah is in thought. I remember I had a guest speaker at uh, one of my homiletics classes in seminary, and he was about communications, and he spoke about body language. And I don't know if it's absolutely true, but it seems in my experience to have been true, as I've the times I've remembered it, (laughs) he said that when people are in thought, they tend to lower their eyes. Have you noticed that? And uh, I'm not always sure I get the direction right, but they lower their eyes, and if they're thinking about the past, they look to the right, and if they're thinking about the future, they look to the left. I don't know if this is absolutely true, but it is certainly true that when you're pondering, you, you, you you tend to lower your head or lower your eyes. And Zechariah is pondering. Because when he gets a new vision, it calls for his attention. While he's still pondering the previous one about uh, about Yahweh's uh, uh, passionate, jealous love for them, how he'll accomplish his purposes, and how he has also anger toward the nations who have persecuted Judah and or, and, and uh, Judea and Samaria and Israel and Jerusalem. We find this in verse 15. I am very angry with the nations who are at ease. And he goes on now to explain through this vision, really at greater length, what God is going to do. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he answered, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Uh, In the Bible, horn is the symbol of strength. David speaks of the Lord as the horn of his salvation. Now, when I was a much younger Christian, being a French horn player, I thought it meant that kind of horn. It does not. 
It means like the horn of a bull or a ram. It's a symbol of that creature's power and forcefulness. Effective power, effectual power. So a horn in many places in Scripture in the Old Testament describes strength, force, power, effectual power, and so on. And so he sees four horns, four symbols of power. What are they? He wants to know. What are these? And this is the interpretive angel still there with him. And he said, he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. These are the nations which have, and indeed which would in the future, cause the Jews great trouble, casting them about, conquering them, and tossing them into exile, and taking them captive, and <clears throat> with their power, destroying the land and just as they had destroyed the temple. And if we cross-reference this with Daniel chapter 2, we see really, and let's, let's look there, turn to Daniel chapter 2. This is a description of nations in succession, nations which we find in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. And so turn there, if you would, please. The, king is given a dream, no one can interpret it, and Daniel is called upon, and he gives the interpretation. It's a great statue. Let's pick it up in verse 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor, and was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. Its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we shall tell this interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Aha. So from the very beginning, we see <clears throat> the statue in this dream is a revelation from God, in this case to Nebuchadnezzar in that dream, to speak about the empires of the world and how they're going to come and go how history is going to unfold. The statue in its different parts represents the different phases of global rule. And after you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. In other words, silver is inferior to gold. So there will come another empire that will replace Babylon. And this would be, historically speaking, Medo-Persia. Inferior to you, then another third kingdom uh, of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. This kingdom of bronze prophesies, uh, uh, and of course, in this case with Daniel, Medo-Persia is being uh, prophesied, but by the time we get to Zechariah, Medo-Persia had already come after Babylon, and then uh, other two horns are going to be Greece and, and Rome. And this is what happened historically. A third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. And that would come to pass through Alexander the Great. And this is fascinating history, by the way, because, because of Alexander the Great, Greek culture spread throughout the, the Western world, throughout the known world at the time, spread broadly. And because that did so, Greek culture took with it the Greek language, which is how we got the New Testament in the Greek language, which is how so many people, through God's providence, have been able through the ages to get the New Testament. Coming back to the text, nonetheless, Medo-Persia would be the silver, and the next empire would be 
the kingdom of bronze, which would be Alexander the Great. And then one would follow. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron. In other words, it doesn't have great value, but it has great hardness. Like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. And in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. So this will be some future kingdom that will not be of gold, not be of silver, not be of bronze, not be of iron, but be a mix. Part of it will be weak, part of it will be strong. Weak like potter's clay, strong like iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron, and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong, and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with the common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. In other words, there will be a progression of different empires And the final one will be divine rule. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. This is the final one. It will crush and put an end to all those kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, in other words, Its origin is completely beyond human, cut out without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place, what does it say? In the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Back to Zechariah. Historically speaking, this is indeed from Daniel's day, what would uh, unfold. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. These are the empires or the nations, the Gentile nations, which have had such a devastating impact on Israel. They are the enemies of God's people, and yet they, in, in their own measure by God's will, using them, as we'll see from other passages, they have been used to discipline Israel. This would leave them in despair unless God would show that he would be providing something for them. Because as they would see, verse 15, I was very angry with the nations who are at ease. As it says in 11, the patrol have... Uh, gone over all the earth, and the earth is peaceful and quiet. But it's not a good thing. These nations, which should be turning to God, as God called the Jews to repent and return to him, they are at ease, verse 15, because they have furthered the disaster. They have done partly God's will, and partly they've just acted in great pride. And so God tells the Jews through Zechariah the truth. There are powerful empires. Powerful kingdoms, nations, which have tossed you about, which have scattered you. But that's not the end of it. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Now this word, depending on your version of the Bible, your translation can be craftsman or smith or a carpenter. The point is that it is someone who is highly skilled at what he does and probably uses hammers and chisels to accomplish it. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, and I said to them, what are these coming to do? Now, Zechariah asks what they are when it comes to the horns, and I believe this is a progression of nations troubling Israel, but then he asks about the four craftsmen, four craftsmen corresponding to four horns. He doesn't ask who they are. He asks, what are they coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations, that is, to break their power, to take their power away from them, to devastate them, who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. 
So God's message to them is very simple. While it looks like the nations are having their way, ultimately I am sovereign over it and I will deliver you from them. I will bring my justice, God says. It looks like they have the power, but I have the power. It looks like they're winning, but I'm going to win. It looks like they're ruling and they're conquering, but I'm going to judge them. I'm going to send my craftsmen to, notice what it says, they, they are coming to terrify and to throw down. And as we find, the horns and the craftsmen really correspond. Because Medo-Persia came along and destroyed Babylon. And then Greece would come along and destroy Medo-Persia. And then the iron, Rome, would come along and crush uh, Greece. But you'll notice there's one left. And that's the final one. And that's the one Daniel speaks about. The stone cut out of a mountain without hands. And we know that Babylon fell at the hands of Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia fell at the hands of Greece. Greece fell at the hands of Rome. What happened to Rome? They fell from within. But in some future time, there's going to be a, some form of revived Roman Empire. And there's coming someone who's going to crush that for good. Which is what we read about in Daniel. There's one who's going to come whose rule is going to what? Fill the earth. There won't be anybody else. The first application for these beleaguered Jews who hopefully have repented is that Yahweh sees our trouble. He knows how we feel. We feel powerless against these great horns. But he says, I'm over them. I'm power. I'm, I'm the power. I rule over. I am sovereign. And Yahweh sees our condition and knows that we are calling out for justice. Oh, Yahweh, what about our enemies? Will they prosper forever? And Yahweh says, not a chance. I'm going to judge them. God is sovereign in his justice. Depend on it. Does he go according to our schedule? No, did he go according to theirs? No, but on the other hand, he waited 490 years before he passed sentence to put them into exile. And then the exile was only what? 70 years. Oh, he's kind. He, he's, he loves them. And he tells them, verse 15, I'm, I'm, I, was, I'm a little, I was a little angry with you, but now I'm very angry with your enemies. Let's pursue more of what he says about this. His, his wrath over the nations, and he sees what they do, and he, and he sees who they are. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. <clears throat> He's perfect in his sovereignty. He rules the nations. He's always sovereign in his justice. You can depend on it. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 18. Yahweh says this. Even in those days, declares the Lord, I will not make you a complete destruction. He is measured in his discipline of the Jews. One of the greatest witnesses to the truth of the factual historical nature of the Bible today is the existence of Israel. Think about it. All the nations and empires that have come and gone. Why are they discovering pyramids all the time, aren't they? Mesoamerica, South America, uh, Eurasia, they're discovering pyramids. What happened? What happened to these societies? I don't know, but they're gone. But the Jews are still around, aren't they? There's a remnant, Paul tells us. A remnant in, in Romans chapter 11. God will punish them, but, but he'll take down and tear down the horns. They will be judged. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30 and verse 11. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you. 
For I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly. And you will by no means, and will by no means leave you unpunished. He's just. He doesn't sweep sin under the rug. You know, there are universalists, say, people who say, everybody's going to get saved in the end. The Bible doesn't teach that. Or there are people, I remember a, 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 fellow, in, a fellow student when I was in high school in shop class. I was an unbeliever at the time. Even at the time, I knew he was full of baloney when he said this. Well, he said, I know that when I die, I'll just tell God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he's so loving and forgiving and everything, that he'll have to forgive me. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We need to understand who God is based on what he says about himself. And he says he is sovereign in his justice, and you can depend on it. Continue in Jeremiah to chapter 46. Jeremiah 46 and verse 28. And by the way, the passage we just read in Jeremiah 30, where it it says that the Lord is going to discipline them, but not wipe them out. The next chapter in verse, in chapter 31 of Jeremiah is where he promises them new covenant, where he'll give them a new heart. And we come to chapter 46 and verse 28. O Jacob, my servant, do not fear, declares the Lord, for I am with you. I shall make a full end of all the nations where I've driven you. Yet I shall not make a full end of you, but I shall correct you properly and by no means leave you unpunished. God's justice is sovereign. It's perfect. You can depend on it. And the four horns that look so powerful, God's going to take care of all of them. He is not indifferent. We look out at the world at times and we think, well, why? How is it? How can so much wickedness, how can it how can it prosper? Turn to Psalm 73. The world appears to be in chaos. How can people be succeeding who are evil? This is a, an age-old question. Its answer is age-old also. It's very simple. Now, in Psalm 73, The psalmist says this, verse 1, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. He's having an attitude problem here. He's having a (laughs) cognitive dissonance. (laughs) For I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. Okay, fat was good back then. All right? It shows they have a lot of money. It shows they can have luxurious food. It shows they're not out in the, in, in working as slaves. They, they have leisure. And uh, uh, they are powerful and rich. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Oh, these evil people are getting away with it, and they're so proud and so arrogant. How can this happen? Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. Wait a minute, this is starting to sound very familiar, isn't it? Imagine, run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Oh, they're getting away with all these wicked words and deeds. Therefore, as people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them, all they keep getting, all they want And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Okay, there's no God. There's no judgment. I'm not going to be held accountable for this. They don't even care. Behold, these are the wicked. And always at ease. They have increased in wealth. How does this happen? But it does, doesn't it? The psalmist is wondering, how can this be? Why isn't it true? 
Good people get good things. Bad people get bad things. No, not always. And he's really, uh, uh, he's really struggling with this. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. Washed my heart, hands in innocence, for I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Well, this doesn't make sense. I'm living a good godly life, but I'm having a terrible time. I'm having trials and suffering. This is not dissimilar to what Job declared, right? I, he never proclaimed his sinlessness. Job never said that, but he said, I'm not guilty of any particular sin for which I am being so terribly punished. But there's a greater perspective, isn't there? Something higher. Get higher up. Get up. Get away from the worm's eye view. Get up there in the sky. Here it is. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I have should, should have betrayed the generation of thy children. In other words, he didn't stay there. I can't stay in that kind of attitude. I know it's not right. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. I want to use just human logic and not get the higher picture of God's sovereign justice, which you can depend on. You just look around you, you lose track of what's really real. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Oh, there is an end. There's a judgment. It may not happen in this earth, but it's going to happen. Surely thou dost set them in slippery places. So maybe they're fat and everything, and they're fat and happy. But they're sliding. Where are they sliding to? They're sliding, sliding down. Sliding down. Thou cast them down. Where are they going to end up? What does it say next? To destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, thou wilt despise their form. Oh. There's an end. Get the higher picture. And so God tells the Jews through Zechariah, I see the four horns. I see those empires. I know how you feel. But I will crush them. I'll terrify them. I'll tear them down. I'll make an end to them. I will punish those who hate and hurt my people. This is his promise. The kings of the earth, they, they, they mock. And it's turned to Psalm 2. When you study the book of Revelation, you see the, and you study Daniel, the rise of the horns and the beasts and the, the, the Antichrist. They, oh, there will be a time when there, they will have global power. Millions will be deceived by them. Millions will worship the beast. But by the way, there will also be more millions, I think, who will come to Christ during the tribulation. They'll be martyred. We've spoken of this before. You know what the word martyr means, don't you? Don't think it's just someone dying for a cause. That's not it. There's no martyr ever like the Christian martyr. No one even comes close. The word martyr means what? Witness. A Christian martyr who's someone who says, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the risen Lord. I am his and he is mine and I will not deny him. They die as a witness of who Jesus Christ is and they do so in full assurance of faith. Not, well, I hope if I die, I'll get wine and virgins. What wretched and vile concept of martyrdom that is. The Christian martyr says, I know who the sovereign Lord is. And so I know his justice will be final. I depend on it. He saved me by his grace and I will be with him. No one can take that away from me. Kings of the earth, look at Psalm chapter 2, or Psalm 2 rather. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. This pictures perfectly what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Go ahead. <laughs> against the Lord and his anointed. What do they say? Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. We will not surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What's his response? He who sits in the heavens laughs. <laughs> 
the Lord scoffs at them. <laughs> Who are you? You're nothing. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Who is that king? The king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And yes, it is on Zion. Yes, it is on Zion. The Lord told Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. So those who want to parade and who want to riot and say death to the Jews, they are going to fail. And if they do not repent of their sin, they will suffer in eternity. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance. The very ends of the earth as thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. So there's a message in Zechariah. There's a message here. It's the message to the world. It's the message that Paul preached on the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17. Where they worshipped an unknown God. And he said God has made everything. He doesn't dwell in a house made with hands. He's made us. In him we live and move and have our being. And he lets the nations go their way and then he brings them back. And he is now declaring that all men everywhere should repent. For there is coming a day when he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having raised him from the dead. The world looks like all four corners are covered. All four horns, all the power. Nope. Nope, God has four craftsmen. They're going to tear them down, throw them down, crush them, terrify them. Read Revelation chapter 19. (laughs) Now therefore, here's the message. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. This is what Nebuchadnezzar said after his seven-year wilderness experience, right? (laughs) The Lord is God, and He puts people in power. Proverbs 21.1 says that the Uh, The king is like water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he wants. Are there people today who want us to believe that we need to get with it because the nations, the fate of the nation is in our hands? Does the Bible say that anywhere? It doesn't. It doesn't. We're responsible for how we behave, right? And for whether or not we're faithful to the Lord, we all want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful slave. But building up and tearing down nations, I want to tell you, that's way above your pay grade. That belongs to the Lord. And He has got it. His justice, His wrath, His grace, His mercy are all sovereign. He's going to make it all right in the end. So our message is, now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest He become angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. And He ends with this. How blessed are those who take refuge in Him. (laughs) There isn't refuge anywhere else, is there? No. God's justice is certain, Israel. You see the four horns. Yahweh sees them too. And he, he understands. He will mete out his wrath on the earth. He will mete out his wrath on those who are the enemies of his people. Turn back to Zechariah. And then turn backwards until you get to Obadiah. Just a couple of pages probably in your Bible. Obadiah, turn back from Zechariah. Obadiah, verse 15. Obadiah 15. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. 
Every tick of the clock, every beat of your heart moves us. We're closer and closer. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Astonishing as we're studying through the book of Revelation, we see how God meets out his judgments. Seven seals, one after the other. Seven trumpets, one after the other. Seven bowls poured out, one after the other. Why do I say one after the other? Because after every one, there's opportunity to repent. And they don't. How hard is the human heart? Isn't it amazing? Are you a Christian? That's because God saved you, isn't it? You didn't say, oh, I was smart. I made the right choice. No, you say, yep, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. He saved me. He chose me. Otherwise, I'd be there. We sang about it. I hear my mocking voice with those at the cross. So that's the kind of person, that's the kind of man I am apart from Christ saving me. We understand his justice will be meted out perfectly. He will judge the nations. And God understands and feels the sufferings of his people under persecution. Turn to Psalm 56. This was true of Israel, and God is not through with Israel. He has a plan for them. Romans chapter 11 tells us there is a remnant still, and that one day all the Jews that are alive at that time will be saved and will be part of his millennial kingdom. We put that together with Revelation, how that unfolds in chapters 19 and 20. But now Psalm 56, to see how the Lord feels about the sufferings of his people. In verse 7, because of wickedness, cast them forth. In anger, put down the peoples, O God. He's calling out for justice for the enemies of himself and his enemies of God's people and thus the enemies of God himself. Thou hast taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? I've comforted people I love who were in tears, but I've never been good enough to collect the tears in a bottle. But God is that attentive. Do you see the picture? To the sufferings of his people and to the justice that is due to them. Turn now to Revelation chapter 7. Those who are saved and martyred during the great tribulation. And we pick it up in verse 15. Revelation 7, 15. For this reason they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. Oh, they suffered, you know. They suffered terribly in their martyrdom and their persecution on the earth during the tribulation. Neither shall the sun beat down on them nor any heat, for the Lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to springs of the water of life. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a description of the Lord. Can you see that tender gesture? You got to get close to someone to wipe away their tears, don't you? He will wipe away every tear. It tells us that also in Revelation chapter 21. Nonetheless, God's people suffer. And we, we have been talking about Israel, but is it true also of the, the church, of Christians? Yes, it is. That's why I just read to you from Revelation chapter 7. These are largely Gentile believers who have come out of the tribulation in martyrdom into heaven. And there will be millions of them. And God will, in answer, and we find this cry before the fullness is in, in chapter 6, when they say, how long, how long? And they're told, well, 
wait until they're fully in. And then in chapter 19, the Lord Jesus comes and brings his judgment on the earth. These are things I know we're all familiar with. But we who are on earth, who are suffering tribulation, how do we think of them? How do we think of those tribulations? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four and pick it up in verse 16. When Paul speaks about his suffering, he's speaking almost exclusively of his suffering from persecution, from his uh, brethren by bloodline, from the Jews, largely, not entirely, but his sufferings were persecution. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says there's a glory yet to come, which is infinite in its weight and value. But what I'm experiencing here, as painful as it is, and he has quite a list of suffering, I'm sure I wouldn't, I'm not sure, but I don't think I could make it through. You look at all the times he was given the 39 lashes, and he was stoned and led for dead, and God had a mission, so he was immortal until God was finished with him. Terrible sufferings and persecution, and he never became bitter. And he says, all of that, even though, and I'm putting him before us because it's very, very personal here. And that persecution can be very, very personal. And he says, compared to the glory, it's just lightweight. And with that in mind, he also knows there is a judgment coming for all those who are the enemies of God's people. Romans chapter 2 tells us that those who do not repent are storing up wrath for themselves. We have a call to the nations, those who persecute the body of Christ. We pray every year. Uh, we, We mark the month of November at Cornerstone. Pray for the persecuted church. And as we do so, We are called to place ourselves in their place, aren't we? To be like as if we're right there with them. And well, we should and we must. And to pray for them to be comforted and to have a sense of God's presence and to be strengthened in their persecution and to be given the strength to proclaim Christ and to preach the gospel. And as we do so, let us not forget to pray for their persecutors as well. For whatever the persecutors are imposing upon the persecuted, it is not much compared to what the persecutors will experience in hell and then in the lake of fire if they do not repent. We think about the persecuted. Let us not forget the persecutors. For Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, love your enemies and finish it with me, Pray for those who persecute you. Our persecutors are our mission field. Our persecutors, our enemies, the enemies of the church, the enemies of God's people, they are our mission field. And as we think of them that way, we have in mind always that God's justice is sovereign And you can depend on it. (laughs) It's not our job to judge them or to hate them. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you say, wait a minute. That's not even human. Right. It isn't, is it? You need to be a spirit-filled, spirit-walking. You know when it says be filled with the spirit, 
It really could be better translated, be being filled with the Spirit. It says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. This is something ongoing and constant. It's uh, being always ready, Peter tells him, to give an answer to those who ask about the hope that is in you. You need to be a spirit-filled, 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 word-filled, word-filled believer in Jesus Christ. You can't love your enemies because you determine to. It is, your choice is involved. But we do so in this light that, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, I hope he burns in hell. Can't imagine saying that. Nothing you could do to me would make me wish that on you. To be raised in an indestructible body and thrown into the lake of fire where you will burn and weep. And those tears will not be wiped away. So we have a message. We have a message for those who persecute us. They are our mission field. And we too should take comfort when we see a world in chaos. That God's judgment, His righteousness, His wrath, His justice are sovereign. You can depend on it. One day, He's going to make the whole world right. (laughs) It's on His schedule, though. Some people say, oh, what? It hasn't happened. He must not be there. But God is not slow, as some count slowness. But He is patient, not willing for any to perish. But that all would come to a knowledge of the truth. That's why we're still here. One reason why we are still here. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He told the Jews, I will preserve you. Paul says in Romans 11, there is a remnant. And in Zechariah 12, we find about out about that future day when that remnant will call out for Messiah. They will mourn as for an only son. They will mourn for me. They will mourn for him whom they have pierced. We pray God's will be done. Thy will be done. His will being done is not contingent on us asking for it. His justice is sovereign. You can depend on it. Some would say, well, how many times do we hear people use this phrase? We want to be on the right side of history. We want to be on the right side of history. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Something about that if future historians evaluate their actions in the now, that the future historians will say, well, they did the right thing. I I don't know how anyone would want to trust in that, knowing how hard it is to actually know history, and to see even in our own day the forces who are trying to completely unwrite history. You've noticed? <laughs> you want to be on the right side of history? Be on the side of the God over it. Because his justice is sovereign. He's sovereign over all the nations. Let the nations roar. We won't be afraid. Let the mountains quake. We won't fear. Why? Because we know the Lord. We have no cause to be afraid in this chaos. And no cause to be vengeful either. We don't want to come to Psalm 73 and say, ah, they're going to get judged. (laughs) God forbid. Instead, we remember to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. They face a fate we have escaped by God's grace. And we don't want that for them. And so we should, should the time come, May we, if God grants it in his sovereignty, be good martyrs. Be good what? Witnesses. Let us pray. Lord, the, we are small, so small. And the world and the nation seem so great. Forgive us for looking at them. Forgive us for looking at ourselves. 
we're, we're so grateful you are so filled with grace and mercy that you, you know how weak we can be and how silly. So bring our hearts and our minds in a renewal, if we need it, to consider your rule and to follow your orders. We acknowledge you cannot do this in our own strength. We acknowledge the truth. We're just branches and you are the vine full of the life we need to bear fruit. So may we be good witnesses, whether for life or death, while we walk in your providence, the days you have numbered for us. Help us to know your will and to do good. These deeds which you have prepared beforehand for us to just under the power of your spirit, walk right into them and do them. And so lead us to be light and salt to a dark and rotting world. Lead us to not resent it, not to hate our enemies. Lead us instead as those who will have our tears wiped away by you personally. To live in compassion and fear both. For we acknowledge that you are sovereign. And acknowledge your grace in your redemption of us. We can never say thank you enough. But we'll try. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. All God's people say, Amen.